All right. Um, it is, ladies and gentlemen and dear colleagues, a great pleasure to welcome you to the public lecture, Recursive Representation in the Shadow of Populism by Professor Jane Mansbridge from Harvard Kennedy School. My name is Alice Elwakil, and here are my colleagues, Arno Stirnemann and Chiara Valsan Giacomo. Maybe they can say a quick hello. Uh, from the Association for Researchers in Democracy Studies, Democracy Net. As organizers of today's event, we are very glad to see so many of you present to enjoy the wonderful treat of having Professor Mansbridge in Zurich. Before I give the word to Professor Francis Schoneval, Chair of Political Philosophy here at the University of Zurich, who will introduce our distinguished guest, I wish to thank the organizations that made it possible to organize this event today. Funding by the Graduate Campus of the University of Zurich via a Utzet um, uh, uh, short grant was indispensable to the organization of today's public lecture, and we gratefully acknowledge it. We also thank the Chair of Political Philosophy of the University of Zurich for administratively supporting the organization of this lecture, and we are very grateful to the peer group of the graduate students from the Department of Political Science, Politics, for offering the coffee and croissant that you could just enjoy before the lecture. This public lecture is also the keynote to a workshop entitled Political Representation in Democratic Systems that will be taking place today and tomorrow and we, that we were able to organize thanks to the cooperation and with the generous support of the doctoral program Democracy Studies from the University of Zurich, which we wish to thank as well. Thank you to all of these organizations for making it possible to organize this event and thank you so much to you, Jenny Mansbridge, for accepting our invitation. Without further delay, I give the floor to Francis Schoneval and wish you all a great event. Thank you very much, uh, Alice. So before anything else, I would like to start by giving a great word of thanks to uh, Alice Elvaquil, to Arno Stirniman and Chiaro Valsan Chacomo and everybody who is active in the Democracy Net uh, group, uh, really for putting together this, this wonderful workshop and for bringing uh, Jane Mansbridge here uh, to Zurich. So uh, a great word of, of thanks to you and of course to all the sponsors and helpers for, uh, for this uh, event. Um, yeah, it is a rare honor and a great pleasure for me, which I humbly accept, to present uh, Jane Mansbridge, who does not need to be presented. Um, because it's not somebody who has only, you know, gained a lot of awards, but in whose names awards are given. So, um, there you have it. Uh, it's really uh, an incredible uh, honor for us to, to have her here. Um, instead of going through the long list of her achievements, of her prizes, of her uh, publications, uh, in, of her positions, I would just like to, to say one thing. Uh, um, what is my take on her great contribution to the field? Because I think she is one of the most important political theorists uh, of the English-speaking world and, and beyond. And if I had to give you one key idea of, of what Jane Mansbridge is all about, uh, what would I give you? Uh, that uh, challenge I gave to myself when I uh, thought of, of presenting her. Now, it's not going to be gyroscopic representation. Uh, it's not going to be surrogate representation. It's not going to be recursive uh, representation. I think the, the one thing that I have learned from, from Jane Mansbridge's publication since the 1980s and 90s <coughs> is that, you know, of course, political science is to help people govern themselves. How do they do that? How do we do that? It's uh, by negotiation, negotiation to agreement. Uh, I think that's the key uh, idea of, of Jane Mansbridge's work. And also in democracy theory, when all the votes are counted, when the majorities are determined and the minorities are determined, what is it about? It's about negotiating, losers' consent, etc. So even that, that term of negotiation that has been misunderstood sometimes uh, despised by deliberative theories, I think at the center of, of her work, it's negotiation. But the production of legitimate coercion goes through negotiation by agreement. That's what I, um, you know, remember from, from Jane Mansbridge's work, and uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about it today. So thank you very, mu very much for being here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me 
by greeting uh, Jane Mansbridge with a big applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming. This is uh, exciting for me, the, all, all these people interested in democracy. I just came from a democracy workshop, uh, which is also exciting. You may have noticed the slip from Jane to Jenny and back to J Jenny, Jane again, and you might have heard people. So I, Jenny is my nickname. I invite everyone here to call me Jenny. You don't you know, move from Professor Mansbridge to Jane and to Jenny in one great whoop. Um, so let me start uh, by um, reminding you where we are in this time of hope and fear. Um, and the hope, it, the hope is here. The hope is in this room. Um, the fear, you're all aware of. Um, it's not just the shadow of populism. It's climate change. It's the possibility of nuclear war. And the question is, can our innovations respond adequately uh, to the sources of our fears? Um, because the democracy we have now, good as it is, it sort of helped us get this far, isn't good enough for the future. So this group of people here uh, and your peers are those who have to help us innovate out of the situation we are in right now. So I'm going to have sort of three parts to this talk. And um, please write down questions in each part, because they'll be slightly different. They, they'll come together. I, uh, but um, I'm, they'll, have, they'll pose different questions. The first is uh, we'll do a free rider problem, populism, recursive representation. So I want to begin with a uh, free rider uh, exercise. I, we should have put these things out. We intended to. Um, Alice, you can maybe get, give some. And I think there may not, we didn't realize there were going to be quite so many people. So if you could tear the pieces of paper in half, and you know, just take half, that would be great. Um, so the exercise, I'm just going to endow you all with um, 100 francs. You now all have 100 more francs than you had when you walked in the room. And now I'm going to ask you um, to uh, give me either 0 or 100. For simplicity, nothing in between, just 0 or 100. Um, and I'll be a doubling machine. I will double everything. For absolutely free, no effort on anybody's part. Um, and then I'm going to give it back to everybody equally, the whole group equally. So it's clear that if you give me the 100 francs, you'll get back your equal share of what everybody gave doubled. But if you actually give me zero, you'll not only get that share doubled, but you'll get to keep your original 100. So you'll be, hun you'll be 100 francs better off than anybody who um, gave the 100. So you can see that it's, um, it completely pays you to get, give zero, because then you get, I hope you're following the logic, you get the doubled share equally distributed back, but you also get to keep your original 100. You're 100 better off than those who've given their 100. But of course, if everybody gives zero, then you completely waste this wonderful doubling machine. And that's the, um, this is, uh, by the way, some people kind of wonder, if more than half give, you will at least not lose your 100 francs. Um, and this isn't a, any trick. This logic was discovered, I'm sure most of you know already. This logic was discovered between 1950 and 1965. Um, it took several, you know, like much human thinking, it was not the effect, uh, the, the result of one fabulous brain. It was a collective effort, people making somewhat incremental understandings until they got the, the full picture. So please now write just zero or a hundred on your piece, uh, piece of paper, fold it over and pass it into, um, pass it down to Alice. Um, and while we're doing that, I'll just explain a little bit of the background here. You've just experienced the common pool uh, version of the free rider problem. I like to call it the free rider problem instead of the collective action problem, because someone who doesn't know what we're talking about can get it much quickly through the words free rider problem. Now, this doubled money, the key to it all is that the doubled money is a free access good. By a free access good, 
I mean that you benefit from it, even when you haven't contributed to producing it. Um, sometimes some of the literature refers to this as a non-excludable good. There are a couple of technical reasons why that's not a good idea. Sometimes public good, that's a very, technically that's, that, that has a lot of problems. We can talk about that later. So I'm just going to, this is a very simple idea that if you benefit from it without contributing to it, well, why well, contribute? Simple as that. Um, so now I'm going to assume that about 65% of you have actually uh, put down the 100. I don't know how many, what percent it'll be, but I'll just, just pick 65%. So the question for those of you who did, I don't know who did, you, 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 but who, whoever gave 100, the question is why? Why did you do it? Um, well, probably a mixture of a couple of motives. Um, duty, which would be the kind of cognitive Kantian, I ought to do this. What if everyone, what if everybody gave zero? So I put myself in, you know, I asked myself that Kantian question and I, well, cognitively I um, understand that I should contribute or just solidarity. These are people in my workshop. These are people I know. These are my classmates. I can, I can get my, uh, from the beginning of my class at the Kennedy School, I teach democratic theory there from Aristotle to Foucault. From the beginning of my class, I give this thing at the beginning of the class, usually get about 65%. Um, and then uh, at the, by the end of the class, I do it again. And I often get 100%. And that's because the solidarity has, has increased uh, as, as much as anything else. Um, so no, we can't usually separate the cognition, the duty solidarity, so I'll... Oh, I see, I was just pushing the wrong thing. So I'm gonna uh, assume... Now, now let's, in, a, in, a, in an efficient society, in a good society, a lot of the collective, a lot of the goods that are of this nature, these free access goods, will be provided by this combination of duty and solidarity. So you can walk down the street and think that you're probably not going to be assaulted um, because law and order is, is, a, is a free access good. Um, not just because um, there are cop police on every corner, but because most of the people coming towards you have got a core of duty and solidarity. But, um, what will happen, do you think, if we run this exercise again? Will the percentage of giving 100 go up or down? Just go like this, a, a point in one direction or another. Will it go down, down, up, up? OK, so up, up. OK, I think actually a few more ups than downs, it's down. Um, the reason is that after, you've, after we've done it once, you'll kind of look to your right and look to your left and think that um, actually um, about, you know, there were a number of people who kind of got away with murder here. And there, so there'll be a few people who are wondering, what should I do, what should I do, what should I do? And those people the next time will decide to keep it in their pocket. So it'll, uh, the giving will, I, this is what happens in laboratory experiments. The giving will probably unravel. So what we do as human beings, supposing I said for you to, pass that piece of paper openly, and I read it with your name on it. So-and-so, uh, Hans, zero, you know, um, Idana, a hundred. There would be a certain amount of social coercion, and probably that hundred, the percentage giving a hundred would go up. So the, what, if you have a little bit of social coercion, or if you have some sort of coercion around, you'll actually protect the people who are doing it from duty and solidarity. Usually, the internal motives of duty and solidarity are contrasted to the external motive of coercion. In fact, we have lots of studies that show that external motivation drives out internal motivation unless it's well designed. Uh, you can design the coercion so that it doesn't, uh, so that it doesn't drive out the duty and solidarity. Rather, it protects it. So it produces this ecological niche for the duty and solidarity to flourish. Now the key thing here is that the coercion to work must be relatively legitimate. Um, and that's what, I'm, that's, that's what all of us are here for. That's why you're, that we're trying to figure out how to make that coercion relatively legitimate. Um, do we have the percentages yet? We do. What? Da-da-da-da, roll of drums. 
Just yell out the number. All right, so we had 27 people putting a hand. Do you want to see? Okay. That means 77.14% of the people. 77%. 77%. Not too bad, better than my class at the Kennedy School. <laughs> okay. And, and that would mean that um, 27 people in the room got 54 francs in addition to what they had already put, uh, and that eight people got 154 francs because they hadn't contributed anything. And now you see why it would unravel. Because as you walked out with your paltry um, number, and you know that once somebody next to you, or maybe down the road, um, kept it. Um, so do you think the number of free rider problems in uh, Switzerland is going to increase or decrease in the years ahead? Again, you can just go like this to me. Increase, 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 increase. I don't see any decreases exactly. You know, it doesn't take too much um, thinking to sort of realize that with increasing interdependence, we're going to have have more and more free access goods that we need to depend on, um, all sorts of things. What about the planet? It, 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 will it, the number of free rider uh, problems for the planet increase or decrease? Again, you know, of course, it's increase. I mean, look at, look at climate change. That's the big, big daddy of all free access goods. We are going to benefit from it whether or not we contribute to it. That's, that's our planet, folks. So increasing interdependence, which is going to happen, is going to produce increasing number of free rider problems. And that's going to produce an increasing need for state coercion. And that is the problem that's been basically driving me for the last decade or so. So our job is to find out, figure out how to, way to make that coercion legitimate, as we said in the introduction, that this is the problem I've, I've been worrying about for quite a while. So, I now want to switch to another topic. You'll see how it comes together, and that's populism. Um, and this is just a, a chart of the number of times the word populism has appeared in books in English over the past number of years. Um, and right at the beginning of it, you can see that well, toward the beginning of it, not literally at the beginning, but as, as people were beginning to think about populism, there was a two-day conference at LSE called to define it. Lots and lots of people, um, lots and lots of talk, uh, international scholars. And as uh, Laclau uh, summarized it, well, <clears throat> a persistent feature of the literature on populism it's, is its difficulty of giving the concept any precise meaning. This two-day two conference produced a big poof. Um, in the, and so Nadia Urbanati, in her most recent um, annual review of political science article just says the terms definitional precariousness is proverbial. So that's the accepted wisdom, can't define the darn thing. Um, so I'm going to borrow some wisdom from Kasmudi and others um, and give populism with, in a work with Steve Macedo what I call a core plus definition. And the core is the people in moral battle against the elites. And then there's a set of characteristics that are not in the core, but are strongly suggested by the core. What do I mean by strongly suggested? For example, the homogeneity of the people. We have um, a way of thinking that homogenizes be, as, as we think. think of, if, if everyone here could just think of the word, uh, the, uh, an example of the word table in your mind. Think of a table. Just a, a particular, an actual table in your mind. Okay, the chances are that that table has four legs. It might even be brown, and it might be round. As getting now that that image that you have of table implicitly marginalizes all octagonal, green, three-legged tables. Your mind just does that. It'll do that with every single noun that you have. In addition, in human society, we have in-groups and out-groups. That's a given of human society. 
And we know from a whole lot of experiments that we tend to homogenize. We tend to assume that the in-group is more homogeneous than it is, and the out-group is more homogeneous than it is. That's, again, we've known that since decades. Then there are the political reasons why we might want to emphasize the homogeneity of us against them and, and exaggerate that homogeneity. So there's lots of reasons why, as soon as you say the people in moral battle against the elites, you're, it's strongly suggested that, you are, that the people are homogeneous, but it's not required. So the American populists, who after all invented the term in English, um, made great stress on the diversity of the people. So does Podemos in Spain. So it's absolutely not required. It's only strongly suggested. Similarly, the idea that ex the exclusivity of the people, that the people are all and the others are not worthy, not worthy. That's something that very frequently happens. It's strongly suggested. Similarly, direct popular rule and nationalism strongly suggested. And then there are a bunch of frequently correlated characteristics. So I'll go through them a little bit. Um, the uh, direct popular rule, uh, I've sort of put in red the ones that are dangerous to democracy here. You know, the American populists um, were argued for um, the direct election of the Senate, for example. A number of the direct popular rule, they argued for some referenda. Um, these things are, are relatively benign. Um, it's when that direct popular rule becomes anti-constitutionalist and you say that it should be the people ruling so directly that it overcomes the constitutional limitations, that's when it becomes dangerous for liberal democracy. Nationalism, again, there are reasons for, um, as, as the work of some people in this room has shown, there are reasons for uh, val valuing the particular nation in which you have, in which others like you have created an interdependence. We can go into that in question period, but um, exclusive nationalism that says we are the best people ever, um, that's much more dangerous for democracy. Um, similarly, a strong leader, if you're coming along and going against all the other parties and trying to create a new populist party, the chances are you're going to need a relatively charismatic leader to, to kind of be the focal point of this effort. Um, but for example, the American populace did not have such a leader. Um, it's not necessary. Um, and in a way, there's nothing wrong with a strong leader who is able to galvanize attention and say, look at this. Um, it's when the leader claims to embody the people that it gets dangerous for democracy. Antagonism to a vulnerable outgroup ought to have been in red here, because that's very dangerous to democracy. John Judas has pointed out that's characteristic of right-wing populism, but not of left-wing populism. And then a whole collection of characteristics that Steve and I put under the very capacious uh, category of the people know. Um, there's a, a kind of an attempt in, in many populist discourses of, of of creating frankness, direct speech, um, using folk metaphor. Um, I'm, we're all sort of the common person, the common man in the old language. Um, that, those, that's perfectly laudable, it seems to me. It, but there's an anti-democratic way in, in which it can become anti-deliberation, anti-expert. The, the truth is what you feel kind of immediately um, and not not what comes out of deliberation and a kind of despising of experts and so forth. Those are the dangerous things. So this is, this is the concept. And what we did, what, what, our argument does not rest on this coding, but we just asked a couple of one, one uh, political science comparativist and one um, uh, philosophy graduate student to code, to go into Google Scholar, write the word populism, see what came up, get rid of all the ones that uh, just talk about one country, get rid of the ones that aren't about political populism, um, come up with the top uh, 25. Of the top 25, only 20, one actually just studied the top seven po populist parties and never tried to define populism. Of the 24 that did, um, all 24 have the people in moral battle against the elites. But no other 
characteristic reached that unanimity among these secondary sources. But that's just another way of saying when we talk about this word, we've got this, um, this way of thinking about it. So what we argue, Steve and I, is that the core actually has dangerous, as democratic functions. It's the non-core that's particularly dangerous for democracy, and that populism and opposition in particular has, and this point has been made by Kasmudi and Nadia Urbanadi and many people, populism and opposition can play a, an important democratic role in power. It becomes, begins to get dangerous for democracy. I'm not saying anything particularly new here, just focusing you on, I want to focus on populism's democratic functions. What are those? Well, one of them is that populism brings to the attention of people like us concerns that have not been previously heard, very, very much heard. Um, it puts some concerns on the table that, and says, listen harder. So if you look at some of the work on populism, I would guess that almost every work on populism has something about the people not being heard. You can go back, you can look at uh, Levitsky and uh, Ziblatt and their work on Peru. Uh, again, the people felt that the elites were deaf to their concerns, led to an authoritarian regime. In the United States, Kathy Kramer interviewing uh, citizens in Wisconsin, rural Wisconsin, and they say, one of them said, the people in the capital are simply not listening to what the people have to say. This is a commonly held, you know, you, you're all nodding because you've heard it a million times. Um, and similarly, uh, uh, Trump. Um, so as, as uh, Jan Werner Müller points out, in response, populist leaders, this is his term, I like it, engage in an aesthetic production of proximity to the people. So. Orban will be interviewed um, every Friday. Um, you know, I'm here, I'm for you. Uh, Chavez has this wonderful show in which people phone and say what their concerns are, and then he tells government members to go do this and go do that and solve their problems. Um, and, and Albright points out that this is true of Putin, too. He goes on these marathon television shows and takes questions from citizens. This is all an elaborate production of listening. Why do they engage in this? Because the citizenry is desperate to be heard. And that's, that's why they respond this way. Now, not being heard is conjoined in some ways to not being able to speak. So for example, the New York Times reports of, of Ger uh, in German, uh, Germany a year ago, um, he, there's this guy, he represents the Social Democrats, um, and he says to the New York Times, well, you know, there's lots of concerns, but let's not fool ourselves. Migration is the most important concern. Um, he says, the way people in my district talked about refugees, they say things for which you would be thrown out of the party. Now think about what that means. That means that there are certain things that can't be said in the party. Now, um, in fact, one, it turns out that one of the big populist slogans is, we say what you think. There's a book in Swedish, Anna Lena Lodenis, V Sager Vad Du Tanker, or whatever. Um, you know, I am unfortunately I can't read Swedish and hasn't been translated. But there's a whole book about this this phrase and how it characterizes the the populist right. So what should be said? There are things that should not be said. And those of you who are in the room who are in philosophy departments, this is a quite important and interesting line to explore. Um, because on the one hand, we want civility. But on the other hand, we do not want to cut off the actual expression of concerns. We don't want to cut off the capacity to say what is of great, of great importance to, to one in a civil way. So, we need to find ways to talk and to question and to listen and to avoid hate but allow concern. That's not easy. And I doubt if anybody in this room, including me, knows how to do it well. Um, but it's something we should be trying to think about how to do. I, I doubt if very many people in this room have addressed themselves to the question of how to do that. 
And I hope you'll address yourselves to that question um, tomorrow and later today and for the rest of your lives. Um, so Ben Barber, who died, my dear friend Ben Barber, who died two years ago, wrote a book called Strong Democracy back in 1984. Um, and he said that the heart of strong democracy is talk. And he defines strong democratic talk as listening no less than speaking. And listening doesn't mean just listening. It means asking questions. Um, this, this has to do with negotiation theory as well. You can't negotiate well unless you draw people out, unless you find out what's really, on, really uh, behind their positions. Um, that's how you get to a good negotiation answer. And it means also trying to respond. So um, that's a prime lesson from negotiation theory. At supper last night, some of us were talking about um, the work that, that I've been doing recently with some colleagues at the Kennedy School, actually bringing uh, negotiation training to congressional staff and to members of Congress and to state legislators and state legislative staff. And after taking the last training, there was a, uh, I said this last night, there, there was an evaluation at the end. Uh, would, would you recommend this training on a scale from one to seven uh, to, other, to other staff? The average number in the evaluation was seven. Not, not a single person did not give it the absolute top recommendation to, for other staff to take. And that's because there's a lot of room, even highly polarized US today, for negotiation and for the skills that negotiation brings. And a lot of those skills are finding the interest behind the positions. I come in with this position, but under questioning, after I think about it myself, after I open myself to ideas of what I want, we can maybe find ways of, of giving each other what we want. For example, n none of us can give um, populists um, their answers to their racist demands or their xenophobic demands. But there are also economic interests that can possibly be met. So let's find out what's really important. Let's see if there are ways of meeting what's really important um, when we can't meet some other things. It's, 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 it's not that different. You can actually negotiate even in the realm of ideals. Um, so what democratic institutions can help us listen to one another? That's the question that um, I think many of you are addressing um, and that a, few, a number of people were addressing uh, at this conference that I just came from that is so inspiring. Um, as many of you know, there's this new institution of trying to draw citizens together by randomly drawn uh, groups uh, with random, random citizens um, for deliberative polls and citizens' assemblies. Doing it right is very expensive. Um, deliberative polls, which I've called the gold standard, um, not to say that other things can't reach that standard, um, have about at least 200 people in them usually. At, which allows them to be representative. And they make great efforts to get the poorer people uh, and so forth. They, they have expensive hotels, and they pay transportation, they pay childcare. So it comes to about a million dollars per deliberative poll. It's not something you can just um, commission t tomorrow. Um, but still, I think very important for bringing people together in in a more deliberative framework and allowing them to talk with one another and listen. Mini public design is a very nice citizens assembly in, in England called the Citizens Assembly on Brexit that had a weekend of information, three weeks going home, and then a weekend of deliberation afterwards. Um, and in that design, um, the participants after the first weekend listening to the experts and so forth, said, well, one of the experts said that um, there's a rule in some EU countries that you can deport people if they don't have a job uh, af um, after um, three months. Is that correct? Is that allowed under EU regulations? And uh, the expert said, you know, the organizer said yes. And so the participant said, well, let's have that among the options the next time around. The organizer said, I mean, what could they say? They said, yes, of course. Um, they didn't particularly like it. I know none of us particularly like the idea of deport, deporting um, 
people, but um, it's, a, it's a very small step. That got a, a major, that option got a majority of, part, of participants at the end of the second session. That option wasn't on the agenda. It was the citizens came up with it. And then what I'm going to talk about now is uh, these e-town halls that uh, Michael Neblo has uh, and his colleagues have created in, um, and that led to my work on recursive representation. Um, so what they've done is to bring together um, uh, from 30 to 175, let's take the 175 people on the internet, uh, to for an hour conversation with their representative about important issues like terrorism or immigration. Just one issue, there's briefing materials, the citizens read the briefing materials, then they get together on the internet. The citizens are very satisfied um, with this. They, they learn a lot, they, they, they're more likely to vote afterwards, they're more likely to uh, learn about politics afterwards. What they didn't measure was whether the representatives changed their minds. And they're in the field now, they're doing a second study, and they're going to be che checking whether the representatives changed their minds. Well, if they did change their minds, then you'd have what I call a kind of recursive system. If, if they do change their minds, and if this is not just a, uh, an another way for representatives to get reelected, um, but if there is, a, is, is some genuine listening going on, this could be an important democratic innovation because what Michael Neblo and his colleagues figured out was that um, if these representatives did this one hour each, twice a week, um, and if they did 52 weeks in a year, including Christmas, which of course they wouldn't, um, they, after six years they could cover a quarter of their constituents. Well imagine, that's in the United States where there's a lot of constituents per representative. So imagine a world in which that happened all the time. Everybody, every citizen would have had this experience at least once, um, and maybe a couple of times, and their friends would have all had the experience. They'd be talking about it over the dinner table. They would, um, the schools would teach kids how to, how to act when, 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 that, when that happened. Um, and our job is to try to figure out some way in which we can turn our representative democracies into democracies in which we move just a little bit closer to the idea that we are making, that these laws that, that, that are coercing us, and there are going to be more and more and more of them, that to some degree they are ours. They are our laws. You know, the old Rousseauian concept of we're giving a law to ourselves. That's the aspirational ideal. Um, so was inspired by that Michael Neblo thing that I thought, you know, we don't even have this as an ideal that representatives should talk with their constituents. Think about the ideals of representation that have come down to us. Trustee, delegate, they're all 18th century. The idea is, you know, you get in the carriage and you go off to London and either you are just going to make good decisions for everybody as a trustee or you're going to have these instructions that are taken with you. The idea that you could communicate with your constituents, not on the table. Well, it, now it is on the table. We can do it. So let's rethink our ideals of representation. This old standard model, you know, the voter elects the representative who appoints the administrator, who then coerces the citizen. In the ideal, <laughs> in the ideal, you know, Oscar Wilde said, the problem with socialism is it takes too many evenings. If you actually did this, the problem with recursive representation is it would take everybody's time forever, et cetera. But as an ideal to move toward an aspirational ideal, um, the, the model here is citizens would have a recursive uh, relationship with their representatives, which means that when they spoke, the representatives would listen and respond to them in their own terms and actually maybe respond with action. The representatives would have a recursive relationship with administrators who would also have a recursive relationship with citizens, and all of them would have recursive relationships with societal representatives. And perhaps most important, well, e equally important, the societal representat representatives uh, would also have recursive relationships with the citizens. So I want to kind of um, go through that a bit. By recursivity, I mean this mutually responsive, ongoing, respectful interaction, um, listening, questioning, responding. 
And it should be happening in my, my two points, and then happening in these three areas, legislative, administrative, and societal. So this would be this legislative realm. And the problems here, you know, right now, massive inequality and in access. I mean, the United States is way, way worse than Switzerland on this. It's, um, elected, and also, elected representatives don't communicate recursively with constituents. They kiss babies. Um, and so forth. They go to e town. They go to regular town halls in which the citizens the, and the, their representatives scream things at them and they say defensive stuff. But that's not real re recursivity. Um, and the societal representatives are also very unequal, even in things like women's women's organizations. Um, Dara Strolovich did a wonderful study of of women's organizations, very progressive, um, you know, very inclusive in, in their ideology. Turns out that the women's organizations generally um, meet the interests of the middle class uh, women, not of poorer women. Um, so, and also the societal representatives don't communicate recursively with their constituents. So the unions may have, um, well, we'll get to this in a, in a moment, but um, let's go to the administrative level. Um, you could have, I mean, it, it would be, it's a nice ideal to have administrators talking with individual citizens, um, but the key issue here is administrators talking with societal representatives. You have that very much in the EU. There's a, Chuck Sable and Jonathan Zeitlin have done a terrific book on, uh, on European experimentalism in which they, in which they show how good the negotiation processes in the EU actually are. Um, they're relatively inclusive. Um, you know, they bring in unions as well as corporations. They, they handle lots of issues. You know, you get um, lots of countries talking about roads, and you bring in all the roads experts, and they negotiate what you do about roads. Uh, so Sable and Zeitlin are, are, have painted a quite good, you know, an optimistic picture of the recursive relations that the administrators have with corporations, with unions, with some of the societal representatives. What's not happening <coughs> is that those, you, those societal representatives are then having recursive relationships with their constituents. They don't do much of that. So I had a student once um, at the Kennedy School who came from East Germany. He came from a, a relatively poor background, and he had done construction before he went to school, went to graduate school, and then became worked in the EU. And he went home one vacation and was hanging out with his buddies in the bar who were con doing construction. And they were beefing about the awful regulations that the EU had done, da 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 uh, And he said, well, you know, actually, there's, there's a reason for that. The reason is X. And his buddy said, well, why the hell didn't anybody tell us? So the union had been involved in the negotiations. The union had actually been involved in creating those regulations. It wasn't that there was no recursive relationship between the unions and the administrators. That was actually relatively healthy. But there was no relationship between, or very little recursive relationship between the unions and their members. So, so this, the recursive uh, representative system is falling apart very heavily on that um, level. Now, let's move from the policy-making level in the administration to um, the street level. And that's, um, that's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. That's where uh, you get the ticket from the cop, or that's where um, the person applying for welfare has to go to the welfare office and stand in line and feel demeaned. And it's where the street-level administrator meets the citizen. How can we make that? more recursive. Um, well, you can come up with some, if you exercise your imagination, you can come up with some, um, some ways of doing it. First, we could go in much more heavily for explanation. So when you got a, we were stopped for speeding, um, now I know in some countries you're never stopped for speeding, like Germany, but um, if you're stopped for speeding in other countries, along with a ticket, you could get a little piece of paper saying why the legislature put 50, or the administration put 55 miles an hour or kilometers, you know, whatever the, the speed limit. Why? Because X number of people get killed over that limit um, as opposed to below. So that would, be, that would be the first step in recursivity, providing an explanation for the coercion. 
the next step would be having a little place on the ticket where you could say why this was completely outrageous, it was very safe, there wasn't a car in sight, da 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 da, da. send it in, and, and, but ask not just your individual, but how should the law be changed so that it becomes fairer? Um, similarly, the, there's a really great book by a guy at MIT about working in a welfare office, a political scientist. Um, he did participant observation in a welfare office, and how upset and demeaned the, the people of the welfare office, the, the, the clients, were, were, were feeling, and how completely stretched out and you know, burned out the people working, and the administrators were, because they had huge caseloads and they couldn't meet them, and uh, these are nice people and they're trying to do good, and, and all they see is sort of horror after horror after horror that they can't do anything about. Um, so this is a very dysfunctional interaction. One thing you could do is say, you know, just put a little sign on the wall saying, um, you know, we only have X number of staff, because uh, that's what we're funded for, and we have Y number of clients. And so you know, we're really, we really apologize that you're, you're not going to get the, basically the attention you deserve. Um, what do you suggest we do to make the weight in, the, in this office? A little bit less grueling. What what do you suggest that we do to make the, you know this this within which within reason? Um, in other words, a sort of a suggestion box. First of all, an explanation, and then what do you think we can do about it? So that people begin to think about it from the other side a little bit. Um, uh, the the wealth the people in the welfare office can the administrators can think about it from the perspective of the clients the clients can think about it from the perspective of the of the uh, people on the of the administrators so now here's the societal realm that I mentioned before where I think we're very very weak we don't have democratic theory that says anything particularly about um, the relations between you know we have a few people Philippe Schmitter had a wonderful civic voucher idea that got lost completely, um, and, uh, but not much democratic theory with Nancy Rosenblum has written a book about voluntary associations, um, very much saying that voluntary associations should sort of be free from, um, from state uh, control, um, and not handling the question of how close a relationship do these voluntary, relation, voluntary associations have to the state? Because as part of the production of legitimate coercion, we are going to need these societal representatives to be connected with the elected representatives and the administration. We're going to need them to be in recursive relationship. And the closer their ties with the state, the more important it is that they have then ties with the citizenry. If it's just an association for knitting or something like that, um, no, no ties with the state, fine. We don't, couldn't care less about how they organize themselves internally. They could be dominated by the chief knitter of the town, and, and we have no interest in it whatsoever. But as that knitting association gets involved with the state to set standards on wool or whatever it might be, then we do begin to care about the relationships with... So this is very under-theorized in the, in the literature. Um, what is all this about? Oh, there's also informal networks. Um, they, they, they have tremendous power, and empirically, they're not studied uh, particularly. So um, I'll just then conclude um, that these three parts of the, my talk fit together in this way, that the free rider problem, if once you begin to think about the dynamics of it, um, we come to understand that we're going to be needing more and more state coercion as, as humans as we go forward. And we have very, our tools for handling that situation both conceptually and uh, organizationally are very weak. So it's really up to you folks, people here in this room and your peers, to think very hard about this idea. Now, when we think about populism, there are many, many causes of populism, which I didn't get into. There's economic causes, cultural causes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the feeling of not being heard is definitely a theme. I saw lots of people nodding when we went through that. So how, how do we handle 
the feel that how do we handle the increasing coercion that we need with the increasing sense among many people that, that, that they're not being heard in the production of this coercion. That's a, a key democratic problem. So what I've tried to put on the table in regard to representation is at least let's add to our ideals of representation. Let's at least add to it the ideal of making representation more recursive. Until you add that ideal, you can't start thinking about mechanisms that will get you closer to that ideal. Um, and basically, as, as political scientists, as philosophers, as human beings, as citizens, we haven't been thinking about that. It's just not been. You can read it in pretty much any textbook on electoral systems, and they'll have the pros and cons of proportional representation, single member districts, blah, 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 da, 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 da. Is the capacity for recursiveness even considered as one of the criteria? No. It's just not on the table. So I would suggest putting it on the table um, and helping trying to think more, more deeply, how can we help citizens in, genuinely move toward owning their own laws? Obviously, we are not all in tiny little towns of, of uh, less than 100, um, making decisions by unanimous consensus so that we can actually say that we are the authors of our law. That's not happening. Um, but are there ways in which we can, without manipulation, without um, without pulling the wool over people's eyes, actually move a little bit closer to having uh, the people ha have a, a warranted feeling that they have had input into the laws, that to some small degree uh, they own them. And that's where the redesign for more recursivity uh, comes in. So that's it. We're going to need increasing amounts of state coercion, and that coercion ought to be as legitimate as possible. And the recursive representation is my little small step of an idea in that direction. So thank you very much for um, listening to me. And I love to, looking forward to hearing your comments. OK, uh, thank you very much, Jenny, for a very inspiring and uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, right now, it's time for all of us in here, and thanks to your about 40 people. Um, I ask all of you to uh, join me, no, to join all of us together into a, a little debate public. And uh, please ask any questions uh, you would like now. Just reminding all the virtual participants that we do have another Q&A session. So if you have more specific questions, maybe later. But for now, please, uh, the floor is now also yours. I hope people will have some. Yes, Hans. Yeah. I thought it was uh, a really about um, what happens if so politicians in power listen listen to where um, the sources of life populism come from, right? That obviously, obviously, populism. Is Yeah, I agree. It has to be part of a transformative program, and yet, you know, we look out there and we say, um, look at the direction of inequality. It's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. It's not getting better and better. Um, so how can we reverse that trend? I, you know, if I knew that question, um, we'd all be better off because I'd share it with you immediately, <laughs> and we'd all go out and try to do it. Um, but. I think that um, capitalists uh, are driven, let's just take the Koch brothers. The Koch brothers are driven primarily by um, you know, their self-interest. But they also have a very strong ideology 
and the ide it's the ideology as much as the self-interest that's driven them into politics and driven them to support right-wing causes in the United States uh, to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. Um, now, they've never heard of this idea. They've, they've never heard of the uh, free rider problem. They've never heard of the idea of increasing interdependence. They've never heard of the idea of have needing state coercion to, to produce duty and solidarity, you know, to protect duty and solidarity. These ideas are completely foreign. I mean, they, they, they would, they would um, and in fact, I doubt if many of your peers know some of these ideas. Mm, you know, the economists will know the, the structure of the collective action problem, but they won't then take the step of, okay, you know, that means incre increasing need for state coercion, that state coercion needs to be legitimate. An economist won't think about that. So I, th I think our, you know, we could have violent revolution, but that hasn't actually panned out terribly well in the past. And Erica Chenoweth's work shows that um, nonviolent non -violent measures have been more successful, um, actually successful, than violent measures over time. So the chances that violent re revolution is going to give us the transformation we want are small. So now we have to ask, all right, how do we do it nonviolently? Um, one way, it's got, to, I mean, our particular currency, the, the currency of the people in this room, are the power of ideas. I'm not going to say the power of ideas is huge, but it's not nothing. Um, and if we can sort of get across the idea that the, the current trajectory is catastrophic, it's not actually going to end in good things. Um, so. <laughs> So somehow that trajectory ought to be changed. Um, it's possible that we can use, dem we can A, convince some of the capitalists, but B, to at least weaken them, because after all, we did have a new deal. I mean, we did have, a, we, Europe did have a welfare state for the while. It was based on, the, on unions, um, the strength of unions, and now the industrial working class is, um, you know, the numbers are, are, dec are tremendously declining. And the, as Piketty has pointed out, the parties have been taken over by the likes of us. And so, the, you know, he's, they're what they, he calls the Brahmin left. The left, the, de the left parties have been taken over by the sort of cosmopolitan elites. Um, and in part because of the actual decline in physical numbers of the old working class, but also in part because of laws that have really, in the United States, there are specific laws that have destroyed the unions. Um, and you, if you, all you had to do is change those laws and you'd get much more union strength. Um, but how you do that is, is another matter. Um, as I said, if I had the answer to how you, how you do that, well, I'd tell somebody who's running for office and, and maybe would would have a change in the politics. So I'm not I'm not being um, you know, we were talking where's Alice? Uh, we were talking yesterday, Alice and I were talking about Gramsci's um, you know, slogan, um, you know, um, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. And I think that's that's absolutely correct. That we have to be clear eyed about what's going on. Uh, but we can't then just say, Oh my god, it's just hopeless and give up. We have to try. And the particular, as I say, the particular currency of the people in this room is ideas. So that's, that's where I've tried to, to help. And the answer is, so the answer is, how do we, ha it has to be transformative. Transformative is a big word. Let's say it has to move in the transformative direction. Um, and, uh, but I, th I think it's possible, it's not, out of, it's not out of the question to move in that direction. That's, thank you. That's a big, long answer to a short question. Uh, is maybe we should collect a couple of questions. I don't know, I, so I don't. Okay, so, uh, let, let's Olivier? let's collect three questions. Yeah. Well, I th I think it's better. I'm a little deaf, so I like to have microphones. Yes, thank okay. you. Um, so, I have to 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. question. No, no, I'd like to have the mic, if you don't mind. I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to bother you, but it, it's good for me. Is our technology declining? Okay, well, shout. Yeah, I'm, I'm very loud. Yeah, good, good, good. good, good. Be louder <laughs> than usual, okay. even. Okay, so thank you very much. I have two questions. The first one is about the concept of mini publics. And um, we were talking before, or you were talking about um, how norms of solidarity, norms of giving erode easily. And given that any mini public in which I deliberate with a legislator is eventually going to have a minimal impact on final policy outcomes because of all kinds of reasons, but above all, the incremental nature of politics and all the constraints that legislators face. So in how far is this going to, or could this give people an enduring sense of satisfaction with what is going on? Because it can also be a very frustrating experience. I, I volunteer my time and nothing comes out of it. Um, I know that people are listening to me, that they know what my preferences are, but then I feel as if they deliberately ignore me, right? And um, this relates to the second question. Um, if we look at individual level research on, 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 on election outcomes and so on, we see that people do care about policy outcomes, but it, they care at least as much about just being winners, right? So, so citing having the feeling that my guy made it or my, my legislator made it to, uh, in the election. And so this is not going to, to give them this type of, of sense. So I can, I can still be a total loser in terms of, or I can feel as a total loser uh, with regard to politics, although I have participated in these types of mini publics. So this is not going to give me a, a, um, an enduring sense of satisfaction, especially considering that a lot of the populist appeal also stresses very simple and radical solutions to very complex and interdependent problems. So isn't this a like, very optimistic view that you stressed, considering these factors? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I, I very much agree with what Anne said, as usual, it's every time. Uh, but yeah, I, I think like the, the way I see it from, from my perspective in, in France is that uh, most laws that are passed in the recent year are at the same time very unpopular, like no opinion polls show that even they're not even close to getting a majority amongst the people. And most economists say they are stupid. Like that makes no sense, like giving tax breaks to the 1% makes no sense economically for the well-being of France and right now they want to privatize all our infrastructures and so, so the thing is that the way I see it is not so much that uh, they don't, they, the, the elite cannot listen or is not aware of it because they are, is the fact that there is conflicting interest and they are serving the interest of the group they, that got them elected. That's on, in France, it's very clear either it's a billionaire that owns all medias and you cannot get elected without them. So there is definitely 
uh, interest intertwined. And, and I think the work for from Aken and Bartels, Democracy for Realist, Organ and Page show that legislation is not passed in the interest of the vast majority of people. And I think that's what populism is successful. Because actually, it's not lying about the situation. There is actually elite interests that are against the majority of the people, and the elite are winning. When you look at winning inequalities, they are winning the battle. So uh, on my sense, the, the real question is that how do you empower the people enough to go against such power and not giving the elite a choice, basically. Uh, and I think in that sense, populism is, in, in that definition, which I draw from Vittorio Rancière, populism is very democratic. It's like, uh, it's like the definition of Machiavel, the popolo against the grandi. And the, I don't think there is a connection directly with hate of immigrants or, and I would just say in the core definition, there is no necessarily uh, hate of, of migrants or stuff like that. But the question, is really like how do you institutionalize strong counter power to that? And even many publics, which I studied, like I, I did a lot of interview with participants in Ireland in the Citizen Assembly, and before the referendum was called, every interview uh, interviewee was saying to me, I hope we didn't do that for nothing. I hope we didn't lost our weekends for nothing. Because the politician didn't commit to submit the stuff to referendum. And actually the first reaction of the Prime Minister was the T shock no, I'm not going to submit that to referendum, it's too progressive. Because they were saying, let's, yeah, let's legalize abortion. And the first reaction was, no, I'm not going to pass that, I'm going to block it. And it took weeks and weeks of protest in the streets to get the referendum in the end. So um, that's really like the, the question I'm asking, like how do you make it so that there is no cherry picking? Oh, that is that I was going to do it anyway, so no, I can say the mini public or whatever the recursive discussion is going my way. So yes, that I'm drawing it from the people, but 80% of the stuff that was said, I'm going to, to put it aside, and I have no answer to that. Okay. okay, these are great questions, and they all cluster together in a sense of saying, um, and I completely admit sort of this idea of recursive representation is a drop in the bucket. Um, in the way of trying to fix things. So I'm not suggesting recursive representation as against other social movements and other ways of trying to change the world. Um, I'm just saying this is in addition to. Um, let me take the questions one at a time. The issue of manipulation, a tremendously important issue. And um, uh, Amarsh, actually, I'm, I, I'm a little negative about Amarsh in the published paper that, um, that this is uh, for precisely the reason, well, no, not precisely the reasons you, because I, I was taking uh, not the pre-selected questions, but the, the very early move in which people went out and created a leave of, you know, of, of all the concerns that people had and so forth and so on, um, which I, I thought was a good thing. Did Macron then, after doing these unpopular and stupid things, send his tr troops out again to talk to people and say, sort of, well, what do you think? Um, tell me about uh, your reaction to these stupid, unpopular laws. I will, I will try to give you some um, reasons for them, um, and I will sort of take back your arguments against my reasons. No, of course he didn't do that. Um, but it wasn't out of the question that he could have. Um, and uh, were we to even have this idea of recursivity, it might have occurred to somebody, for example, the young man from the Kendi School who organized that first thing, might have occurred to him, if he'd had the ideal, that gosh, maybe it would be a good idea to go back. Um, that, that just wasn't on, in anybody's head. Um, but manipulation, yes, is a tremendously, uh, your larger question is, can we just trust the p process to produce virtuous feedback, or indeed, will there be a, um, a, an opposite, uh, then, then now I'm going to go to this, sort of one of the other questions, w will there be an increased cynicism? There will be all this excitement the way that there was about the Amarche first um, going into the field, and then, it, oh, it's just all window dressing, it's just, uh, it's just politics as usual, the interests are what's running things, and this is um, you know, a, a lovely little piece of window dressing. Uh, the, the representatives are engaging in the production of, of, of a, an aesthetic of, of recursivity, which in fact has no effect whatsoever. Um, 
I don't think we can trust uh, virtuous uh, feedback just to sort of happen. Um, but luckily, we human beings are learning machines. Um, and so, for example, Michael Neblo, after doing this um, set of experiments, um, and coming and saying, oh, how wonderful, all the constituents, blah, blah, you know, they, they learned so much, and now they're active in politics, and da, 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 da. And um, I said at one of some APSA meeting, and also in an email to him, you know, what about the representatives? And he said, oh my gosh. So he's going to try to find out. Now, supposing he finds that the representatives don't change their minds, that's going to make us all move back from being very positive about this new uh, mechanism. Um, we also might ask, is there something we can build into the process that will make it more likely that the representatives will change their minds? And I have a little tiny bit of hope in that direction um, because um, David Brookman and a colleague um, have shown that even uh, pro progressive representatives overestimate the conservatism of their of their uh, constituents in the United States. I don't know what, what's true in other countries. That, that work has not been replicated yet in, in other countries, and I urge the empirical political scientists among you to think about replicating Brookman's work on the representative's understanding of their constituents' views. Um, Brookman and his colleague didn't have an, a set of explanations for why there was a systematic misperception of constituents' views in a, in a conservative direction, but it may have to do with um, the media and interests and so forth and so on. Um, if, so, when, so if that is the case in places other than the United States, if it's, even if it's just true in the United States, well then actually finding out from one's, one's constituents that they're not that conservative could be helpful. And it also, um, the, the, don't underestimate the power of storytelling. People in these, in these uh, interactions say what happened to them. And that often makes, um, I've spoken to representatives, those stories sometimes stick in people's minds. One problem in the US representative system is there's a tremendous vacuum of, creati of creativity. The representatives are incredibly busy running from one place to another, kissing babies here and, and trying to be on this committee there, and uh, mostly spending four hours. I mean, the Democratic Party asks its members in Congress to spend four hours a day, four hours a day in fundraising. So, um, so they're having a great recursive relationship with donors. I, I, mean, I, get, I, I give money to progressive causes, and I get phone calls. Oh, what do you want? You know, um, and I, I just say thanks. I'll just give, you know, at the end of the year and clog. Um, but if I were to, uh, um, my husband engages with the mother, other donor. We have very little money. I mean, but we still get these calls, um, and the really big donors are have a, a constant recursive relationship. Um, so the representatives are hearing a lot about that. Um, and there's pr practically nothing on the other side. Um, so um, I think that, that because human beings are learning machines, we've, we've had this small dimash with small first step in Michael Neblo's work. Well, can it be tweaked? Are there ways of making it more likely? And what about response? Um, that can be tracked as well. And if it turns out that there's no policy response, why not? Um, I, from, in my own uh, view, looking at what's happening in Washington, is that there's, as I say, very little creativity. That um, people see things as zero-sum games. They don't, they don't try to think about how we can negotiate to something that gets, that, that gets more genuine agreement, that actually meets more people's needs, because they don't have the time. They, you know, to, to think, as opposed to just thinking in platitudes, to actually think creatively, <sighs> you have to step back a bit. I mean, that's what's so great about writing a dissertation or something, is you actually get a little bit of time, and you won't have it very often later in life, um, but, uh, you know, to, to think. And our representatives don't have any time to think. So, okay, that's where the societal representatives come in. Um, and the think tanks of the parties and so forth. Can there be creativity in some of these uh, ways of responding? I don't, I don't know, but there is room for improvement. Um, so many publics, uh, similarly, um, if there's no outcome, uh, won't it just lead to, um, to greater cynicism? Absolutely. 
Um, and so that then leads to, you know, can we tinker? Can we change it? Can we, can we for example, have a kind of report card? Um, the mini public makes X recommendation and then some, whatever uh, media outlet has been involved in the mini public, like this, there's gonna be a big one for uh, about, uh, in America in, in, in a couple of weeks, um, that the New York Times is involved with, and, and in the past, Channel 4 in Britain has been involved and so forth. Well, so that it could be part of the whole process that six months later or three months later, the, that media outlet asks, well, what happened? What's, you know, what, what's been the response? If, they, if, if representatives knew that that was gonna be brought up, there, there are ways of, 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 of possibly tinkering with the system. I'm not saying they will be successful, but, but that's what we have to do. We have to experiment, see where the failures are, and then instead of just kind of giving up, see if we can change it. it may, at a certain point, we might say, we do have to give up. That was a nice idea, forget it. Not, not, was, it turned out not, not to be useful at all. Um, many publics are now having this wonderful, oh, everybody thinks many publics will solve everything. Well, let's see what they can solve. Let's see how, how different kinds of designs can produce. We're just at the beginning of this. Um, but yes, I think absolutely. The, the kinds of people who do many public work are not at, as, at all as conscious as they should be of this very, very possible result of simple increased cynicism. So, okay, so how do we try to build outcomes and so forth into it? Um, that, that, so the outcomes, and now in, in regard to outcomes, people wanting to win as well as have, wanting to have a good outcome. Yes, that's true. Uh, so let's think that people want outcomes that are in their favor. They want to win, that's just because people like to win. But as Tom Tyler has shown us, people are also actually very interested in the justice of the process. That's a third component. And so convicted criminals, can feel, will, he, in his interviews, he finds that convicted criminals feel better about the outcome that if they've, you know, if, if, the, if they think the process, even if the outcome has gone against them, if they think the process has been good. And interestingly, when we say the process has been good, we don't mean that it's just legally clean. In fact, quite the opposite. It turns out that in the United States system, criminals prefer the process of plea bargaining to the process of an open court hearing. Even though plea bargaining, we all know, is very, very um, open to um, the domination of the administration. But the, the, the actual people themselves, the criminals, prefer it. Why? Because they can be heard. In the open court, there's a lawyer speaking for them, there's cross-examination, and they can't tell their story. Their story is whatever it is. You know, I was, uh, my mother, you know. That's their story. And in plea bargaining, they can tell it. They can present themselves as who they think they are and why, what the situation is as they see it. In the court, it's all about the party of the third part and the da 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 and none of it's about them. So they actually consider more just, they, they prefer the process of, so we, we need to, I think, pay a little bit of attention to how, how individuals experience our institutions and how, um, how we can change processes so that they, they are both normati normatively legitimate and also perceived to be legitimate. Those are two different things, but normative legitimacy should underlie perceived legitimacy. Um, so unpopular and stupid laws, um, you know, yes, pa Ben Page is a friend of mine. Marty Gillens has become a friend of mine. Um, but ben Page was the only person there when I got married to my husband. Um, you know, he and I go back for a long time and there's their work that Dimitri, um, may, many of you may not know, shows that if you look at public opinion across, the, t across time in the United States, um, it looks as if the laws are following public opinion. Because in many instances, elites, the, the moneyed elites, um, and the people agree. But if you take out, if you, if you control for, um, for, for that, if you look at when, uh, when elite and public opinion diverges, then you find that public opinion has, and then I think John Stewart, who, um, who uh, at that time was 
still doing the Daily Show, he called it, I think, the scariest line he had ever seen, which was, this is the effect of public opinion on, um, out, on outcome, policy outcomes, once you control for elite opinion, namely zero, a completely flat line. So that's the, so how do we, how do we, how do we change this extremely stark fact? Uh, you know, little recursive representation is not going to change that. Um, it'll, I change it on the margins, but that's not going to be the, the big driver. We've got to do some other things. Um, uh, but I think that the fact that the many representatives actually don't have an incorrect view of what their constituents want and don't have the stories is one bad, small bad thing. Um, so those are, so are there, there's got to be other questions. Thank you very much. Is that it? Oh, no. OK, one question. Or two more, very concisely. The other questions were concise. It wasn't that the other questions were. OK. Huh? Yeah. It's OK, shout while she's fixing it, because we don't have too much time. So, yes. One of the reasons, one of the reasons uh, for the rise of populism in the last 10 to 15 years. But I would counter you on one point, and uh, maybe I'm a little bit provocative, but I, I would even say that your model is a little bit populistic, populist too. Um, because what are you saying is that the elites are actually the problem. Uh, if they would only listen more to the people and engage more with the people, there wouldn't be a problem. So, so if you help the people to be heard, then the thing is, uh, the problem is uh, going to be solved. That implies two things, that the people are, are actually not heard, but is this really true? Are they really not heard? Are, is the white, may, it, it may be true for the Brexit vote, of course, but is it true for the white uh, middle class who voted for Trump? Are they really not heard? And are all those people not heard who write all those dreadful comments in the uh, comment sections uh, on newspapers or whatever? Um, that's the, one, the first uh, point. And secondly, it implies that they actually protest with their vote. But do they really protest against being not heard? If you look at the exit polls, uh, the vote in Saxony last week, People uh, vote for the AFD not because they're not heard, but because they are they want another society. So they actually voted for xenophobic, racist party, and they're absolutely aware that they're voting for this party. So my point, or my, my I'm not sure whether it's a question or a point. Um, isn't it better to focus on those people who did not vote for the right yet? instead of focusing on those who vote for the right. I'm totally with you. There are a certain percentage or a certain amount of people who are to be won over, but there are others who are not. And I'm not sure if I'm really willing to speak to them. I'm more this kind of guy who are, who are willing to fight them on every part. So question is, uh, Got it. would you be with me on this point? Or would Got it. So, so, Tom. Thank you. Just to jump in, it's kind of related, maybe a follow-up. So what I take from your talk is that we should listen closely to each other and more closer than we usually do. And I totally agree that among Democrats, let's say, and among Democrats with different, very different ideas of democracy, we should do that much more often than we do right now. But how to deal with the anti-constitutional demands, how to deal with the non-democratic demands? So um, earlier on, you said we should look closer for the interests behind the positions, and in a way that relates to the questions, I, I think some of the interests still remain non-democratic, so how to deal with them? Thank you. Uh, I'm possibly extending the dimensions a bit there, but do you think some of the ideas that you have could also extend to the global level you explained from the nation states down to the communities? Thinking about uh, climate change that you mentioned, there will be free riders or can be free riders of the nation states. Is there a way to also push that direction? Thank you. So, great questions. Um, let me uh, just go through them one by one. Uh, just, am I suggesting that it's the elites that are the problem? Uh, I, 
I think I gave that impression. That was a wrong impression. What I meant to say was more the language uh, that came out in the second question of that we should be talking to each other, uh, not just that the elite should be listening to the quote unquote people, um, but that but that the people should be listening to the elites. There should be some one of the one of the um, impetuses behind some of my thinking was a. Um, an interview that I read long ago, um, and I, I put in an early article in the APSR um, uh, when I was looking at representation, um, that I think John Kingdon, I uh, can't quite remember who, who it was who did the original empirical research, maybe, maybe um, Bill Bianco, uh, at, at any rate, uh, interviewing a member of Congress about catastrophic health insurance, and he said, a catastrophic health insurance was, was a, 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 what seemed to me a, probably a, a very good policy. I don't know, I'm not, but, but progressives were all for it, um, and probably it was a good policy. And, the, the rep, and there was the insurance companies had huge ads against it, showing two people at a kitchen table saying, oh my gosh, darling, if this goes through, we'll be ruined, you know. And, um, so, and the representative said to the interviewer, if I could sit down with each of my constituents for even five minutes, I think I could explain why I want to vote for, for this policy. But I'm going to be voting against it because I have no capacity to explain with this barrage of ads and so forth. I, I, I just, there's no way I can explain. And I thought reading that, that's a tragedy. That's a democratic tragedy in front of my very eyes, so to speak. Um, it's, of course, the, the policy itself, you know, I would have liked to see the policy go through. But the real tragedy was the de democracy aspect of it. So, um, so I think it's a matter of also being able, the people being able to listen to the, the elites. And in an, let's take the on marsh thing. Had, had those young people gone back, they could have tried to make arguments for those laws. Maybe they were. Maybe the laws weren't quite as stupid and as, as they seem <laughs> to me. Um, but you know, maybe there were some arguments for it. Well, make the arguments. Uh, um, try to explain um, that that capacity. So when I'm talking about recursivity, I really mean both sides uh, 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 listening. Um, so um, uh, not just the elites. Um, now implies not being heard. Um, uh, are the white middle class not heard? No, the white middle class are heard. Um, are the racists not heard? No, the racists are, are heard. But there are groups of people who previously voted social democratic who are now voting right wing. And similarly in the United States, there are, people, there are groups of people who previously voted for the Democratic Party who are now voting for the Republican Party. Um, and when you listen to some of the things that are, they say, um, you think, yes, um, it's it's correct. The Democratic Party in the United States, which is the one that I can speak of the best, um, hasn't paid a lot of attention to those concerns. They're, those concerns, the, the concerns of rural um, and working class you know, people in, the, in these bombed out cities where the industries have left, they don't have many societal organizations, um, particularly with the unions gone. Um, they don't have many societal organizations representing them. They don't have people giving their you know, presenting theirs. And so, for example, uh, what, how much time do we have? Are we over? Yeah. Uh, well, maybe some of you in the workshop, I, I can talk about the Trade Adjustment Assistance Act, which was an attempt to make up for, you know, you, you do good free trade and helps everybody, but it hurts some people a lot. This, this very stupidly designed policy didn't really help the people in the harmed areas at all. And it went on for decades, 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 decades. It was put in in 1964, you know. And evaluations show that it was useless and so forth. But the, the representatives in those areas didn't say, you know, we need to rethink. We, we need to figure out some other ways of handling these problems. Those, those people were not being heard particularly. And those are the people that I'm, um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in. Um, <laughs> anti-constitutional demands. Um, yes, the interest behind um, the, again, as I, I said about racism, so, so too with anti-constitutional demands. You can say, well, I can't meet that demand. It's, you know, it's, it's asking things that I, I cannot give. But what else in your panoply of interests do you have that I can perhaps meet? 
And people may not know. And that's what a good, negotiation, a good negotiator does, is a good negotiator says, well, let's just have a beer, you know, and tell me about your life. Oh, X, hmm, you know, does that mean, hmm? You know, does that mean, might you have an interest in this? Might you have an interest in a better job? Might you have an interest in some things that are not on your agenda, that you didn't come to the table saying you wanted? But then I find out, as I find out more about your backgrounds, I find out that you actually might want some of these things. Some of these things I can give you. So uh, I can't give you a destruction of our constitutional system. That's something I can't give. But what else can I give? That's, that's the process of recursivity. Global, can we take this to a global level? <laughs> um, that's, where I will, that's where I will defer to the, what is the name of your book? The Government of the Peoples. I'm very, I haven't read the book yet, but I'm very much in sympathy with the cosmopolitanism that does not uh, go, just simply go beyond the nation state, but uses the nation state as a building block. How we do it, I, I, I can't tell you I'm not in that field. But I do know that, as, you, as I've said before, that, that human beings can make experiment, learn from our experiments, change the experiment, do something other, Try something else. Uh, we didn't get to be here with microphones and water and iPhones and you know PowerPoints and all this everything um, just by not trying. Um, we did it through experimentation and 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 then fiddling. Uh, so I'm not you know pessimism of the intellect. I am not really sanguine. I'm, I have a grandson, and I worry very deeply about whether he'll go, grow up in a world that's habitable. Um, but optimism and the will, we have to try. And it's you guys who have to do it. So thanks very much.